How would you design an API that would generate a transcript for a given video by its ID? When I asked this on Twitter, I was accused of clickbait and it actually led to a really interesting response from a fellow YouTuber. Let's check it out. If you're designing an API endpoint to generate a transcript for a specific video, a video by ID, how would you do it? And that's a question posed by James Quick on Twitter, where he gave the options of one post request that has the ID property in the body, a get request that has the ID in a query parameter. Now, I'm not sure if the question solutions were engagement bait. If they were, it's working because what I want to do is expand on that question and those two options because I really don't think they fit in a common scenario. I love I love the, the question of clickbait. So nothing, nothing I ever post on Twitter is intended to be controversial. I do like to ask questions of people to get their idea of preferences. And I will agree, we'll talk about this in the video, that this was kind of the wrong scenario to ask also a valid question. So he'll get into uh, the idea of long running HTTP API requests and why you shouldn't do that. I totally understand and I agree with that. Uh, but I think there also is for something that wouldn't qualify as a long term or a long running HTTP API request, this is a valid question. But I do get how this seems conflated and it may seem like it was for engagement on Twitter, although it's not. But I did have lots of people respond to this and give their opinions. So anyway, not intentionally controversial or clickbaity. It was a genuine question, but I do agree that uh, the question probably should have been caveated to the point uh, that he's going to make here. So, But before we get to my solutions, let me know in the comments how you would design this API. In that common scenario, not everything's a quick response. So the idea is that you're going to make a request to generate a transcript, and that's the end of it. And it's just a fast request response. The reality of it is, that's where I'm taking this and expanding on this, is generating a transcript likely isn't something that's going to be very quick. It could be long running. Yeah, this is... 100% true. So um, I'm actually kind of trying to figure out, I'll talk more about the reason why there's limitations in, in what I'm building, um, but I'm trying to figure out how long those requests take and transcribing a video to text can take seconds or a minute or multiple minutes. And that oftentimes will hit limitations and runtime limits in serverless functions in for self, which I think is 10 seconds by default, unless you pay for a higher tier. So that is, that is a big concern. And this is something he's absolutely right. This is something that takes more than a few seconds, probably. And typically in those scenarios, you're looking to do some sort of async processing on the back end and not just making the front end wait the entire time to, um, to see what's going on. So he'll talk about that in a second process that's long running or workflow behind the scenes that's long running is that something's going to take a long time. Do we really want to have the client make that HTTP request and just wait for the no. generating of that transcript? Likely not. Before I talk about some solutions, I want to thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational skip, databases. So for Event Store, I'm concerned about more the root of the problem what I really want to see yeah. or think about is how do I handle a request that's going to take a long time? We're going to have a long running request. One solution is... So he's he's really just changing the question, which I agree. These are like two separate questions. There's the question of like, do you do the ID in a query parameter or do you do it in a route parameter for something that doesn't take a long time? And then there's how do you handle these long standing uh, API requests and long standing or long running. These are requests that take like seconds. These are not necessarily like minutes. It's just longer than the traditional uh, HTTP request that you would expect to perform that work asynchronously so that when our client makes a request to our HTTP API, we're not generating that transcript or doing that work immediately. Rather, we're just going to place a message on a queue. Then we can return back to our client very quickly. Separately, we can have separate... Yep. So this is... If this is new for people, I think this is essential for people to understand like the idea of asynchronous asynchronous processing. So what happens, as he said, the request comes in to the back end. The, the back end then basically puts that message on a queue. And a queue is a storage system that maintains the messages on the queue until they're actually processed. And the code will determine what is processed. So what he's going to say is you have a worker and a worker is constantly looking in the queue for work to do. So the item in the queue would be like, here's an ID for a video that needs to be transcribed. The worker would go and grab that message, would then process that thing. And then the message is gone from the queue because it's been processed. It's actually a very important topic in um, asynchronous programming, processing, whatever you want to call it separate process or thread, pick up that message from our queue, then perform the work of generating the transcript. But there's a problem that we introduced, which is before, if you're generating the request immediately, we could return the request as part of the response. But since now we're generating it asynchronously, how do we notify and communicate back with the client when it's completed? One solution to this is... Yeah, so since, since the asynchronous stuff is going on, you're not able to give a response directly back to the calling client to let them know that something is done. Basically, what you're going to do is give them an acknowledgement of like, hey, we have the record of the thing. It's safe in the queue. We know we need to process it. So we're going to send a response back to say, hey, we got it. It's saved. It will be processed, although it hasn't been processed yet. 
It's having a resource that provides the status of that initial request. So here's kind of the workflow of what it looks like. We have our client make that HTTP request to our to generate the transcript. That's a post request, for example. The response of that is going to be a 202 accepted. In that, there's going to be a header that's going to have location to a status resource, some URI that we can then make a GET request to. And its response there might be a 200 OK. There's some different debates on this if this is going to be 200 or 404. But in either case, what it's going to indicate is that the resource isn't that new resource that you're creating, the transcript isn't available yet. So you then may pull that request after some retry that also can be provided in the header to say, OK, I'm still looking for it. Maybe if it does exist at that point, and asynchronously we've generated that transcript, now we can return a 302 found with a location header to the new resource. So that way, our client now knows where the new resource is, what that URI is. We're providing it to the client. It can make that request, that GET request, and then we can pro provide it back the transcript with a 200 OK. Now, this is actually a really common pattern, but you might be thinking, wow, that's incredibly gross. Like, we're doing polling? <laughs> really? This is 2024. We're doing polling? Yes, you actually are doing polling, but you got to think about it. Not all context is given in the browser. You may have situations where you have an HTTP client that's not living in a browser. This may be more like server-server integrations, and this is one way of handling that, but there are more. Yeah, so... So the idea of like returning back the original status to basically acknowledge, hey, front end, we got your request. It's saved in the queue. It will be processed. And then how do you get the updates as that thing is processed? And there's two ways to do this. The first way is to do polling, which is what he said. And that's basically on the front end, you're having like a retry cycle of uh, every second or three seconds or five seconds or whatever it is. And you're showing, you could show a loading indicator while uh, that polling is taking place. And you poll until the back end says like, hey, we actually have that thing processed. And for me, in this specific example, basically what that would be would be to query the details of the video record and see if that transcript property has been updated. So we'd query that record to see if the transcript is there. If so, we would return back the actual record or the, uh, in his case, he uh, had a ID for the record, but that ID in my case has already been created because uh, it already exists. We would just return back the record. And then on the front end, as you get that successful record back, that full record back that has the transcript, you can uh, stop showing loading, you can go to a different screen, you can do whatever, so that's polling. The other way to do this, and this is actually probably an ideal way in certain regards, is to have socket connections where you are able to send server sent events back to the client to say, hey, this thing has been processed. So you basically register a socket connection from the front end to the back end, and then the back end does its work, and it pumps out messages back to the front end to say, hey, this thing is done. Now, there are some potential implications of like, what if you lose the socket connection? What happens? How do you handle that? So you probably would also want to have something querying from the back end as well, just to be sure, depending on what happens, like if you refresh the browser, et cetera. Uh, but anyway, so those are your two different options are to poll, as he's saying, or to have some sort of uh, socket connection from the front end to the back end and be able to send updates from the back end to the front end. Now, this would especially be useful in my specific scenario, because I'm going to potentially be doing more than just the transcript. And I don't know exactly what that is, but there could be like four or five different things that I do. So it could send back updates to say like transcript created, video optimized, video, I don't know, converted to something. I don't know what it is, but you could send back those updates progressively as it's doing those incremental things and then have a finished status at the end. So if you have the means to push data to client, or you have two-way communication, or you have some type of persistent connection, well, those are yeah. also options. So as an example, That's let's say- the two-way two -way connection, socket connection from front end to back end to send messages and updates. That you had a WebSockets connection, you can make that connection with your HTTP API. You can then still even use separately your just existing request like we were doing before that kicks off the work to our broker. From there, that initial request is done, but we still maintain that WebSockets connection that's persistent. Once our work actually happens from there, and depending on the technology you're using, we can then push that information back with that WebSockets connection to tell it, yeah. okay, this job is done. Here's some information. Here's the transcript itself, or just even providing with the URI so it can make a subsequent get request to that new resource. But really important aspect of this that I'm trying to convey is that when a user just clicks a button that makes an HTTP request to a server, there's oftentimes a lot of things that need to happen. And it may not be quick. It may be one action, but that one action may spur a lot of actions and turn into some really long-running business process behind the scenes. All of this is very applicable where you want to give back notifications or feedback to the client about something that's occurred. Here's a really simple example of this. Yeah. So all of that is is perfect, makes perfect sense. Um, really appreciate him like doing this video and giving like a deep dive into how he would handle this and calling out the important technical implications of the question that I posed, which again, I agree should have been posed a little differently. But I think he has an example here uh, that does something similar. I'm going to have a link to this video that has all the code to illustrate this at the end of this video. But what it does is I have on the left window, just a customer facing way of ordering pizzas. And on the right, it's kind of the admin side where you can see all the orders and go through the different status changes through them. So I'm just going to actually order a pizza here really quick. Just enter some fake data. And here's our order. We can see that it's placed. I have two different windows. They're using WebSockets though, so that as things happen, we can push those changes to communicate yeah. via WebSockets to the client. So if I see I can do start preparing, it immediately changes the, the other window. That's our customer facing one out that's for cool. delivery and delivered. And that example is exactly that's the same awesome. thing as that original question that posed this whole thing of generating a transcript. Again, in that one, you have different states of like, preparing the order, alpha delivery, deliver, delivered, 
and then you can uh, update the UI based on those things. That's a really great example. Is that there's some long running action. It could be a single action. It could be the same thing as delivering a pizza where it's just long running business process. It's all the same thing is that things are done asynchronously and in that comes the challenge of communicating back with the client. And everybody can relate to this. Let's say you're placing an order on an e-commerce website, you enter your credit card, you hit submit. Not immediately is it going to save the record <laughs> to a database, charge your credit card, and then send out an email confirmation. Likely in most big websites, those are all done asynchronously. And what happens if your credit card fails for whatever reason? You enter the wrong number, wrong expiry, whatever the case may be. What happens? It doesn't expect that we have some technical solution where you're just sitting in your browser and there needs to be a WebSockets connection. No, not at all. You're going to get an email telling you your credit card failed and ways to, to remedy that back on the website by updating it. Yeah. But an email is a form of communication. Asynchronous work is all over the place. So hopefully this just give you an idea of different ways of handling it. I'll have a link to another. Now, the interesting thing for me where this gets more difficult is trying to do this in a serverless environment. And I don't have a great answer to this. So for what he's saying, you need something to be able to store the messages in the queue. And then you need some way, some some code running somewhere to act as the worker. Now the worker is the thing that's constantly checking the queue to be able to process messages off the queue and do whatever work there is. I don't know how you do that in a serverless environment. So if I had a fully deployed node application, you can just have a cron job that spins up every minute or whatever, go search the database and see if there's any, or the queue to see if there's any work to be done and then go and do it. Uh, without that, I don't know, I don't know how you do that. And some platforms now have crons built in, but they have limitations on maybe how many times you can make that request, et cetera. So there's that limitation of like, how do you create the actual worker code that processes messages <clears throat> off of the queue? There's also the limitation of how long functions can run in serverless environments, especially, like I said, in uh, Vercel, where the limitation is 10 seconds by default. So I'm, I'm thinking for these type of applications, I'm hitting limits in serverless that actually make more sense as a fully deployed like node application or whatever backend you want to use, which is really interesting because of how big serverless is at this point uh, to still be thinking about like this would be easier to just build with a fully functioning backend. So another video at the end of this video that kind of illustrates the asynchronous world around us. If you enjoy videos like this and you want to chat with other software developers, you have questions or you want to provide answers. Cool. So that, that's just his wrap up. I, I don't I've never met this person. I don't really know anything about them. I think this was a, an awesome video and an awesome recap and an awesome explanation again, of the technical implications that were missing contextually in the original tweet that I posted. So if you wanna uh, go back and rewatch the video or just check out more of his stuff uh, on the Code Opinion channel. I, I really enjoyed this. I think it was also done like respectfully, like calling out, not calling out, but like bringing up something from someone else could be a little controversial if you do it in the wrong way. But I really appreciate that this was like really just diving deep, deeper into technical details that are super, super value for, valuable for people. And I think we're spot on and exactly the right response. So I appreciate this. Go check out his channel, uh, subscribe to his. I will actually subscribe right now. There we go. Because I want to see more of his takes. And those are actually interesting types of videos to do where people post something and then do kind of a review of that on a YouTube video and then give an architecture overview. So anyway, go and check out his channel. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested on more of what I'm working on, specifically with that project and a couple other projects that I'm working on, the best way to stay up to date is my newsletter at jameshuquick.com. You can scroll to the bottom or you can just go to slash newsletter and sign up there. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you next time.